This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermin Sheikh. We turn now to look at the humanitarian crisis unfolding in Afghanistan. And we begin by looking at how we got here. A damning new report in The New Yorker magazine looks at the failures in U.S. diplomacy that led to the Taliban's seizure of power in August. The report includes interviews with high-level Afghan and American officials who took part in negotiations during both the Trump and Biden administrations. It's headlined, The Secret History of the U.S. Diplomatic Failure in Afghanistan, A Trove of Unreleased Documents Reveals a Dispiriting Record of Misjudgment, Hubris and Delusion that led to the fall of the Western-backed government. For more, we're joined by one of its co-authors, Steve Cole. He's a staff writer for The New Yorker magazine and dean of the Columbia Journalism School. He's also author of many books, including the Pulitzer Prize-winning Ghost Wars, The Secret History of the CIA, Afghanistan and Bin Laden, from the Soviet invasion to uh, September 10, 2001. Uh, Steve Cole, welcome back to Democracy Now! It's great to have you with us. Why don't you lay out uh, your most significant findings that surprise you most? And let's be clear with these negotiations. This wasn't negotiations that included the Afghan government. It was negotiations between the United States and the Taliban. Yeah, thanks, Amy. Thanks for having me back. Um, let, well, let's start with the big picture. Uh, the United States, during the Trump administration, entered into direct talks with the Taliban. And the stated purpose of the talks was uh, twofold. One, to find a way for the United States to withdraw from the war, but secondly, to end the war in which Afghan Afghans were primarily suffering. Um, and what we have discovered, I think, by taking a really close look at this record is that uh, in the end, uh, the, the peace talks weren't about peace. They were about America leaving. And at every intersection where the United States faced a choice between prioritizing a reduction in violence, a ceasefire, some kind of political settlement uh, among uh, Afghans between the Taliban and the Kabul government, uh, rather than um, insisting upon that, uh, it, it instead uh, built an exit ramp uh, to, to leave itself, and, and we all saw the result last August. Um, the record is uh, full of uh, detailed conversations, both within the negotiating room and uh, between uh, the White House and, and the Kabul uh, government, led by Ashraf Ghani, President Ashraf Ghani. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of shocking kind of conversation and detail. The, the essence of it I found, you know, I've been reporting uh, in general and around Afghanistan for a long time. I, I was still kind of shocked by the degree of cynicism um, that the United States often brought uh, to this endeavor to seek peace, uh, particularly during the Trump years. Steve Cole, you mentioned uh, that, of course, at the time, uh, Afghans were the ones who were primarily suffering. And just to specify what you write in the piece is that since 2015, fewer than 12 American soldiers died every year, while at the same time, 8,000 Afghan security personnel were dying annually. And of course, according to the UN, several thousand uh, Afghan civilians were being killed every year. So could you explain what you understand about who was pushing for uh, uh, prioritizing the US? And in particular, talk about the role of Zalmay Khalilzad. What was his role, his background, and what, was, uh, what eventually happened as a result of the negotiations that he was leading? So the first part of the question is, um, I think, you know, the record suggests that President Trump wasn't closely involved in these negotiations, as we've often seen about his presidency. He didn't really understand uh, Afghanistan. He said some things uh, that we were able to document in important meetings that indicated that he, that he had, at best, a cursory understanding even of the leadership of Afghanistan. Um, he designated this to Secretary Pompeo, Mike Pompeo, and um, uh, the best uh, indications that, that I think our evidence provides are that he was probably making the most important high-level decisions in uh, 
in Washington. Um, you ask about uh, the special envoy who Pompeo appointed to carry out these negotiations with the Taliban. That's Zalmay Khalilzad. He is an Afghan-born American who um, earned a doctoral degree at the University of Chicago in political science and served in several Republican administrations prior to the Trump years. He was the United States ambassador to Afghanistan uh, in the early 2000s after the fall of the Taliban government. He's deeply experienced in the region, um, but he had been out of government for quite some time when he came back into this role. And um, he's a very complicated figure. We try to uh, give you all of him in this piece. Um, you know, I think he started out believing that he could negotiate peace um, and was ambitious about that, you know. Uh, uh, and. But at, at important intersections, he faced all these choices uh, as an envoy of the Trump administration. Uh, what are we going to do? Are we going to prioritize the United States' interests and its withdrawal, or are we going to slow this process down or take a different approach in order to prioritize peace among Afghans? And I'm afraid what the record shows is that, uh, perhaps under pressure from Secretary Pompeo, but in full complicity, uh, Ambassador Khalilzad uh, you know, prioritized the U.S. withdrawal and and ignored Taliban violations of the agreement that they had reached and uh, put pressure on the government in Kabul uh, to do things it didn't want to do. As you pointed out in the intro, and I think it's important for listeners to understand, uh, you know, there are three parties uh, to this war, broadly speaking, uh, when the peace negotiations began, the United States, the Taliban, and the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, which is the formal name of the Kabul government, constitutional government. The Islamic Republic was never at the table in these negotiations. The U.S. negotiated in effect on its behalf, and we can see that the result uh, didn't exactly secure the Republic's interests. And Steve Cole, explain why the, the Kabul government was not involved in these negotiations. That was something on which the Taliban insisted and Ashraf Ghani, according to your piece, uh, and uh, generally reported, uh, Ashraf Ghani felt sidelined in these negotiations. And it seemed in some instances, again, as you document, that the U.S. appeared to be more insistent in getting his government to compromise rather than putting comparable pressure on the Taliban. I think that's an, a very fair statement of what the record shows. Um, and to this this point about the Kabul government being sidelined, uh, you're you're right. The reason it was was because the Taliban insisted on it. They just absolutely refused to sit at the table uh, with representatives of uh, their opposition in Afghanistan, as they saw it. They refused to even speak the name of the Islamic Republic in the documents that they signed with the United States. And the United States went along with this on the theory that if the U.S. could reach its own agreement with the Taliban about withdrawal and then the Taliban providing counterterrorism guarantees to the United States, that little two-way conversation and agreement would be the basis for then opening up negotiations between the Taliban and the Afghan government. Now, was that theory um, plausible? Should anyone have ever tested it? Of course, they should have tested the theory, but what happened was that the Taliban made clear uh, pretty quickly that they were not interested, in fact, in having those negotiations with Ashraf Ghani's government, that they didn't want to sit at the table with them, that they didn't want to share power. And, uh, you know, you can read the record. The question you might ask is, like, if you were negotiating this, uh, at what point would you have recognized that the Taliban simply weren't going to compromise and then come to terms with that reality? Uh, the answer is that there were many points along the way where I think many of your listeners, if they were bargaining in this uh, setting, would have said, OK, that's enough. Uh, clearly, this other side doesn't want to come along. And th then you have to go down a different path. Uh, you know, none of those choices are great either, but at least you're dealing with reality. And that, that's the kind of dispute, one of the dispiriting parts of this history, I think. When I wanted to go to an interview with the Associated Press earlier this week. It's former Afghan President Hamid Karzai uh, saying Kabul had not fallen to the Taliban in August. He had invited them in. It was a request to, to come in and protect the population so that the country, the, the city doesn't fall into chaos and the uh, uh, um, 
unwanted elements who would uh, probably loot the country, loot shops. So it was an automatic process subsequent to that, and an and inevitability. So that's Hamid Karzai. And people should understand that the Taliban were inside the palace, and um, the Hamid Karzai's compound is essentially attached to the palace. They are right next door, adjacent to each other. When the Taliban walked out of a conversation in the palace, I mean, his point is well taken. They did not, every time we keep repeating, seized power. They entered a power vacuum. But can you talk about Hamid Karzai's position right now? Well, uh, it's complicated, and I don't know enough about it to really be, um, you know, trying to describe exactly his circumstances. But he did not leave the country, um, and uh, he has not left the country since the Taliban uh, formed their, their interim government. Um, I don't know whether he wants to leave or not, um, but he hasn't left. And. Um, you know, as to his uh, comments yesterday to the Associated Press, I mean, let's bear in mind, he, he says he invited the Taliban, and he had, he, he had no authority. He was a former president, um, and he had been appointed. That this, what happened in the last 24 hours is, is really interesting and complicated, and I think, you know, I don't feel like I sorted it out uh, entirely. I can describe some things with confidence, and the other things look a bit muddy, but what was happening was that uh, the United States, uh, Khalil Zad, uh, Ashraf Ghani, and uh, uh, former and current politicians who were not part of Ghani's government, but who were in Kabul, such as, such as Hamid Karzai, Abdullah Abdullah, and others, they were trying to figure out, under enormous time pressure, whether there was some way to hand over the city uh, and the country, in effect, to the Taliban in a more orderly way than would occur without an agreement. And Hamid Karzai was involved in those discussions. He was supposed to fly out of Kabul down to Qatar to talk to the Taliban about this question. He'd been appointed to do so, along with 12 other people, by President Ghani. He never got off the ground because the Taliban essentially swept into the capital and, and took over um, before those talks could even begin. So it's a somewhat confused situation. Uh, I do think that President Karzai today, former President Karzai, is in a, is in a complicated position, uh, which is hard to evaluate from the outside. Steve, you mentioned earlier uh, the many points during these negotiations uh, at which uh, the Taliban seemed to prevail when it was not a good idea to allow them to prevail. And one of those points uh, as you write about, is their insistence on the release of 5,000 political prisoners. Could you explain when that happened, uh, how the Ashraf Ghani government was forced to concede this, and what its effects were, immediate effects? Yeah, well, um, it's, it's perhaps, uh, at least in my experience of the work on this uh, history, um, it was perhaps the most dispiriting of a series of dispiriting episodes. Um, it just uh, is very hard to look back on it with, with uh, anything other than a sense of being appalled about it. But uh, the, the short story is that the United States and the Taliban, after conducting these negotiations, signed an agreement in February of 2020, the Trump administration and the Taliban signed this agreement. And the agreement contemplated that as soon as this agreement was signed, uh, by the way, it's, its basic provisions were the U.S. said it would withdraw by May 2021, and the Taliban said it would protect the United States against terrorism. So they signed this agreement, but there were other provisions. And the other, the most important was that the Taliban would begin negotiating seriously a peace agreement with Ashraf Ghani's government. Within 10 days, there was a specific schedule. The Taliban said, nah, we're not really ready to get started. You need to release 5,000 prisoners of ours before we will talk to the Afghan government. Well, the United States signed up to say, the United States didn't hold these prisoners. They belonged to the government of Ashraf Ghani. So the United States said, well, we can't release them, but we will, we will work to facilitate their release. At that point, uh, the Trump administration embarked on a pressure campaign on Ashraf Ghani's government to release all 5,000 of these prisoners. Now, Zalmay Khalilzad, who was the envoy, was the, the, the main negotiator for the U.S. And what he said to 
Ghani, as our our investigation shows, in kind of meeting by meeting and and blow by blow, what he said to Ghani was, "Look, you don't you're not going to have to release all five thousand. Find find a thousand or two thousand, release those low risk prisoners, and I'll get the Taliban to come along." So Ghani said, yeah, "Ghani says, you know, I don't really like this, but." I'll do the work. He identifies a thousand prisoners. He releases a thousand. Taliban say, "Sorry, we mean five thousand. And by the way, here's a list of the specific five thousand that we want, and we we don't want any other five thousand other than these." Uh, and back and forth they go. The Taliban never yielded. The Trump administration increased its pressure month after month on the Ghani administration. Uh, the list of the five thousand included. You know, a couple of dozen who had uh, committed basically murders of uh, American and Australian and French and UN personnel uh, who were had been imprisoned. It included hundreds of people that the Afghan government had convicted of uh, very serious crimes. Uh, and Ghani didn't want to let them. It certainly didn't want to let that last 500 or so go. But the Americans kept telling him, if you'll just do this. Let all 5,000 on the Taliban list go. Then those negotiations, those peace negotiations that we're all here to advance, they really will begin, and there will be a reduction of violence, maybe even a full ceasefire. Well, you know, the Afghan people have been suffering from continual war. As you pointed out, they're taking more than 10,000 civilian and military and police casualties every year. That, those are killed in action, not just wounded. Tens of, you know, so suffering. And here's this promise. If you'll just release these 5,000, we'll get those peace negotiations going and, a, and a, a reduction in violence will follow. So Ashraf Ghani finally capitulated. He released all 5,000 using a, a traditional assembly to endorse the decision. And what happened? There was no reduction in violence. Uh, the talks sort of began in that uh, a delegation uh, a, a, arrived to, to negotiate. But nothing happened. The Taliban refused to negotiate about anything. Uh, and they just sat there for months doing nothing. And meanwhile, the war intensified. Uh, the violence got worse. So, uh, you know, people blame the Afghans for their contributions to this disaster. And, and you know, we all know that this uh, Islamic Republic government was deeply flawed in, in many respects. But when you look at the pressure that the United States put on its junior partner, its, its supposed ally, to undertake this prisoner release uh, on the basis of promises that turned out to be completely false, um, you know, it's, it's, hard, it's hard not to sympathize with the, the anger um, that Afghans feel about that episode. And we're going to talk about the humanitarian crisis in a minute. Uh, Steve Cole, we want to thank you for being with us, staff writer for The New Yorker magazine, uh, also dean of the Columbia Journalism School. We'll link to your new piece with it, Adam Nentus, headlined The Secret History of the U.S. Diplomatic Failure in Afghanistan. Uh, Steve Cole is author of the Pulitzer Prize-winning book Ghost Wars, The Secret History of the CIA, Afghanistan and Bin Laden from the Soviet Invasion to September 10th, 2001. And most recently, Directory, Directorate S, the CIA and America's Secret Wars in Afghanistan and Pakistan.